from the European Parliament here in Brussels, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us tonight and this is what we have for you on the menu political blow a surprise setback for angela merkel are her days numbered damage control romania's prime minister has a heated meeting with european politicians ahead of a controversial vote the anti-trump emmanuel macron sells a very different worldview at the united nations brussels bound uk opposition leader jeremy corbyn heads here to talk brexit and in tonight's Raw Moment, the U.S. president becomes an accidental comedian. Well, it's time to meet our panel for tonight. We have, of course, Darren McCaffrey, our political editor at Your News. Darren, which of these stories are you watching? Well, she's been uh, the head of Germany for 13 years, the most powerful woman in Europe, one of the most powerful women in the world. But if you look at the German newspapers today, it does seem that Angela Merkel may well be teetering on the edge. Uh, revolution inside the CDU, I think, was the headline in Bild this morning. Uh, it's not looking good. It isn't for Mrs. indeed. Merkel. It isn't indeed. And tonight we're also joined by James Crisp. He is a Brussels correspondent for The Telegraph. James, what about you? Uh, I'm going to be keeping my small beady eyes firmly <laughs> fixed on Jeremy Corbyn coming to Brussels. Uh, it's, it's Brexit all day, every day for me. And when a man who has vowed to vote down uh, any Brexit deal that Theresa May presents is coming to town, I... I'll be waiting for him. Absolutely. And we also have David McAllister. He's an MEP with the European People's Party from Germany. David, which story are you looking at closely? I'm actually interested in the situation in Romania. The government has been confronted with serious allegations, and we're going to have a debate on the situation in Romania next week in the European Parliament. We have to be very clear that certain developments in Romania for us are not acceptable. Okay. And we will have a lot more on all of those stories, of course. But first, let's start with our top story. Major blow, surprising revolt, political bomb. Just some of the ways an unexpected setback for Angela Merkel is being described today, fueling speculation that after 13 years, major cracks are forming in her coalition. Well, the German chancellor had handpicked Volker Kauder to lead her centre-right coalition. But in a surprise move last night, members of her party voted against him. Instead, they chose the challenger Ralph Brinkhaus. And here's what Merkel had to say afterwards. Das ist eine Stunde der Demokratie, in der gibt es auch Niederlagen und da gibt es auch nichts zu beschönigen. Aber trotzdem möchte ich, dass die CDU-CSU-Bundestagsfraktion erfolgreich weiterarbeitet. Und deshalb werde ich Ralf Brinkhaus, wo immer ich das kann, auch unterstützen. Well, she's almost, you know, shrugging it off there, almost as if it's not a big deal. But how big of a deal is it? David, I'll go to you. Is the media making a big deal using all these strong words? Well, the election of Ralf Brinkhaus yesterday was a surprise not only for the political landscape in Berlin, but also for our own parliamentary party. But on the other hand, change is something normal in democracy, also in internal parliamentary party democracy. So Ralph Brinkhaus might bring some new ideas, some fresh ideas and new action to our parliamentary work. But he very, made very clear that he fully backs Angela Merkel as a person and also her policy. And Ralph Brinkhaus has served as vice deputy leader under Volker Kaud over the last few years. So I think it's not that exciting as some journalists believe it might be. But he be. hasn't been overly critical of Angela Merkel. That is true of her policies. That is true. But he is open to the ideas of the opposition. James, what is your reading of, of, of this uh, surprise? I mean, I think move? basically anyone who underestimates Angela Merkel uh, is a fool. I think she's proved herself to be a great survivor. I don't think you can underestimate the effect, well, the extent to how some politicians here in Brussels have had it in for Mrs Merkel ever since she uh, opened the borders to the migration, uh, to the migrants. Uh, I personally think that was quite a heroic move. Many other people think that it may have sown the seeds of her destruction and also mm. set up this battle between populist nationalist forces and pro-EU forces in the European Parliament elections. And her, uh, her uh, I think the problem here is if, if, if this was an isolated defeat or, you know, she said she didn't want to sugarcoat it, it is democracy in action, you know, we wouldn't be talking about this. But what we've seen really since the election, this rather, you know, unstable coalition, is, uh, you know, stumbling kind of essentially from one problem uh, to another. Uh, that is not good. And when you've been around for 13 years, you do start to, no matter how good you are, no matter how uh, powerful you have been in the past, you start to move into that almost lame duck stage where you kind of 
events spiral beyond your control. Mm. And it, there is a sense, I feel, that we're now in that situation in Germany. Well, let's get about. more of a sense of what is actually happening in Germany. Uh, let's get perspective from there, from a Politico's chief Europe correspondent, Matt Karnitschnik, uh, joining us from Berlin. Matt, is this really the beginning of the end for Angela Merkel? Well, I think there's no doubt that it's a major defeat for her because she had a hand-picked person that she wanted to lead the group, the same man who'd led it for the past 13 years and who, in fact, had been her deputy at one point when she held that position. So I think that there is really no question here that this is a major defeat for Merkel. And the, the real question is how much longer can she hold on as she faces a number of other challenges in the coming months with the election in Bavaria coming up in mid-October and another one in the state of Hesse. And then she herself will face election uh, within the party in December when the uh, CDU holds its uh, party Congress. So I think that Merkel is uh, on the ropes at the moment. And as was said previously, she is a survivor, but uh, she's had so many crises with this new government. If you think back to uh, just the, the last few months, uh, you know, the, with the coalition that she put together with the Social Democrats almost collapsing on a couple of occasions, mainly due to the type of infighting that we've seen over the past couple of days. So I, I think that there's no doubt that this is the beginning of sort of maybe the gradual end of Merkel, but she's no longer the sort of unquestioned uh, leader of Germany that she has been for a long time. All right, thank you for that. Uh, Matthew Karnitschnik, uh, Politico's chief Europe correspondent, they're talking to us from Berlin. So I'd like to put this question, I think you raised that idea earlier. Is it really so bad if Merkel is no longer at the helm? Stefan Seibert, our government spokesperson, made very clear today that Angela Merkel won't call for a vote of confidence, and rightly so. Why should she? She has the full support of her political party and the CDU-CSU group. Ralph Brinkhaus was very clear uh, yesterday evening and also the whole of today. And we now are facing a not easy situation in Germany. That's correct. It's rather unusual that a CDU-CSU group leader has voted out of office in a meeting. This is a surprise for many. But what we have to do now is concentrate on the enormous challenges we are facing in Germany. And if we do that, housing, nursing, pension, the health system, many other issues, then we can regain the confidence of the yeah, voters. Yeah. David, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to jump in. I mean, you talk about the enormous problems in Germany. I mean, things aren't going that great in Britain. Theresa May has been going from crisis to crisis to crisis, and she keeps clinging on. I mean, I look at Germany and I think you've got it easy. I don't think this is a crisis for Angela Merkel. I don't think you guys know what a crisis is. <laughs> Well, that's why I just heard, I agreed with most of what you said, but I certainly wouldn't use the term lame duck for Angela Merkel. That <laughs> certainly isn't true. The exact opposite is she is the chancellor, she is the leader of the party, and she will decide if she runs again as our party chairwoman, and we will decide on the next federal political conference how, how, in December. How, how much, forget about the rights and wrongs of the decision made in 2015 around immigration, but how much is the, the trouble that she's in, the problems that she faces, the last election result, how much is that down to that All right, I'll give you 30 seconds to answer that. Too. Well, the last election result wasn't easy, and we would have liked to have had another coalition with the Liberals and the Green Party, but the Liberals ran away, so we had to continue the Grand Coalition. But I want this Grand Coalition to succeed, so we have to concentrate now on the issues and stop fighting openly. That is what's getting on people's nerves I'd, I'd also like to bring up the, the, what, what Europe is thinking with, with you know, the, the stability of Europe, we can say, is dependent on the stability of Germany. Is that, is that a fair thing to say? I, I think that's undoubtedly true, and clearly Angela Merkel has been, you know, not just a powerful figure in Germany, but a very, the most powerful figure in, in, uh, in Europe over the last, you know, decade or so. Um, what happens when she departs? We don't know. It's one of the reasons, clearly, why Emmanuel Macron has taken on this, uh, you know, this mantle to a degree, uh, really, since he's been elected. Yeah, but he does need he does need Germany to move this, you know, vision. Well, of, of course, of they Europe. always, now, you know, the Franco-German alliance absolutely. moves in a certain direction. And speaking of that, speaking of that alliance, actually, we're, we're also looking at Emmanuel Macron, indeed, another high profile EU leader who was taking center stage this week. He gave a fiery speech at the UN General Assembly. Take a look. N'oubliez jamais que les génocides qui ont fait que vous êtes là aujourd'hui 
Ils étaient nourris par les discours auxquels nous nous habituons. Parce qu'ils ont été nourris par les succès d'estrade que nous applaudissons. Parce que nous sommes en train aujourd'hui de voir se déliter ce droit international, toutes les formes de coopération, comme si de rien n'était, par peur, par complicité, parce que ça fait bien. Non Moi, je ne m'y résous pas, parce que je viens d'un pays qui a porté ces déclarations qui nous font là, parce que je viens d'un pays qui se tient debout, qui a fait beaucoup d'erreurs, beaucoup de mauvaises choses, mais qui a su tenir à chaque moment de son histoire et de l'histoire internationale, une forme d'universel. C'est aujourd'hui, c'est maintenant. Alors ne vous habituez pas, n'acceptons pas. Well, that was very dramatic. I mean, James, do you think that he sees us as just, a stage where he can shine? Because I'm sorry, maybe back I'm, home just, I'm just getting so tired of this shtick from Macron. <laughs> I mean, it's like, how can you consistently be so passionate about everything? It just isn't credible. It's an act. I don't believe him anymore. It's... Is it, because, yeah, is it because it's the only place where he can actually shine now in the international right. stage abroad? Right. He can stand there and no one will challenge him. You know, it gives him an opportunity to say his bit. But I've seen him do it, the same thing in the European Parliament, after every summit. You know, everything is oh okay. so emotional and oh so important. And I think it's stretching the limits of credibility. I, I, think there is, I think there is a certain thing that when... And we've seen this with other uh, leaders, when there are difficulties at home, when there are domestic uh, problems, the world stage, in some ways, as James points out, is not just a safe space because it tends to be less... Uh, challenging, but it also builds into the ego. And whenever we think about Emmanuel Macron, and, and all politicians but potentially, small potentially man, big ego. Have, have got egos. I didn't want to go that far. But also, James. but also, to just to point out that he was making a point by point rebuttal of Donald Trump's uh, speech. Is he branding himself as sort of the anti Trump from Europe? Well, the style was typical Macron, but the content was good. I like what President Macron had to say in New York, making very clear that we in Europe are in favour of multilateralism, that we are in favour of a fair global order, and that we are against any kind of nationalism and isolationism. So, a good speech, and I think this was a good European response to one of the... Do you think anyone's uh, listening to that message of multilateralism? Well, where's the place to address something like this than at the United Nations General Assembly? Uh, I And I think the point is that, you know, Europe keeps talking about how it needs to find a more important role in the world, how it needs now to be a counterweight to America, given where Donald Trump is. And to be perfectly frank, you know, James has got a point that you can't always operate on, on fifth gear, but Europe needs people like Emmanuel Macron mm. because, you know, no offence to Donald Tusk or to Jean-Claude Juncker, who are also speaking this week, I mean, they're not going to rile a crowd's. Uh, they're not going to get people uh, listening. Emmanuel Macron has clearly got the ability to do it, and Europe could probably do with a couple more of him. And uh, speaking of, you know, that, so one, on one hand it's the image, on the other hand it's the content of what he had to say, and in that speech he was also talking about the youth and the responsibility that politicians have to the next generation. So our team in Lyon, Alex Morgan and The Cube have been looking into that part of the story. Alex? Tessa, I think it's fair to say, yes, the French president talked about the issues facing young people, but these guys probably got more of a reaction. You might be forgiven for not recognizing who they are. They are K-pop band uh, BTS. Now, they are a huge uh, deal across South Korea, and they addressed the UN on Monday. The message of their speech summed up here in a tweet from their account. Love yourself. The kind of message there to young people was, yes, accept you've got flaws, you'll have personal struggles, but speak out, speak up, recognize you have a voice. Sort of an empowering call to young people to play a role in their future. These guys also took part in the launch of a new UN initiative. You can see them here, the poster boys for it, quite literally. Uh, a new partnership which ensures every young person, the UN says, will be in education, training or employment by 2030. So if you like, these really are the people on the world stage that have got a lot of young people talking. And here in the Cube, we've been speaking to uh, young people around the world, getting a sense of what they took away from uh, this speech. This is 28-year-old Dr. Kakon. She's speaking to us from Bangladesh. She's a medical graduate. And it was the message of that BTS speech. That is what's uh, stayed with her. Let's have a listen in. Namjoon of BTS, the way he said to love myself and then to speak about my problems, to speak yourself. If we don't have a voice, who will listen to us? 
if we don't have a voice, who will listen to us? The idea here is it's not uh, for other leaders, for older leaders to be talking for young people. It's for young people to be talking about young people. So a really strong message there. There's also been support for the scheme that the, uh, the boy band got behind. That's that UN scheme. Um, this is a 21-year-old student. She's speaking to us from China. And for her, the only way to lift young people out of poverty is through education. And that is the only way nations can develop. This is what she had to say. Without proper and integrated biosocial development of youth, a nation cannot reach her intended goals. As a country like Bangladesh and many more around the world where poverty is common, Generation Unlimited will bring forth many opportunities for the youth for a better future. So there we go. So support for what those boys were standing there for. So you can see that those key UN messages, at least, seem to be filtering through. What about in Europe, though? Let's bring things back to Europe. This is, uh, very quickly, just leave you with what uh, Francisco, he's 21, he's a student. For him, world leaders are standing a world away the from what young people The certainly is the most cosmopolitan generation ever. And our interests and concerns are in line with that. Uh, so we're losing sound there. Basically, what Francisco goes on to say Making is he says that this generation is the most cosmopolitan ever. And world leaders, he says, on the world stage are thinking in terms of individual nations. So for him, there's a real gulf between what the world leaders are saying and what young people care about. So Tessa, just some of the thoughts from young people they've given us to chew over. All right, thank you for that, uh, Alex and the Cube team. James, you were reacting while that was going on. This generation is the most cosmopolitan generation ever. What a revolting, self-regarding oh, well. comment that is. I mean, that's precisely... I mean, that's now, how look, they I don't want... That's how they think. Oh, I mean, that's... that's how I feel. That's how I think. You know, yeah. who cares? Well, who cares? I mean, it's just so... Don't have to care. Look, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say, look, the, the idea of getting a pop band to tell people to love themselves... No, look, when you're a teenager or a young person, you're meant to be miserable. You're meant oh. to go through pain and heartbreak. And your pop band should be introspective and you should think, woe is me. But you shouldn't go around saying, our generation is the most cosmopolitan generation ever. It shows a I huge think, self I think, I think it is. insight uh, yeah. into James's childhood. Uh, <laughs> No, but I but think... you, you have to get these young people to vote there. For sure. And to vote for you. That's not an easy task. Well, as a father of two teenage daughters, I'm very interested in what young people have to say, and I always find it's a good idea if young people get involved in politics. And, of course, it's good if students get together, are interested in international politics, if they tell us what they expect from politicians. It's OK. Do you think this is the most cosmopolitan generation ever? I thought it was our generation, wasn't it? <laughs> All right. We can discuss that <laughs> later on. But we have a lot, we'll more, a, a lot more coming up on raw politics. Ahead of Romania's referendum on same-sex families, the Prime Minister had a tense meeting with a heated meeting with European politicians today. Plus, trust issues, a plea from the UN Secretary General about the state of international politics. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Well, the Alliance of Socialists and Democrats had a high-profile guest today, Romanian Prime Minister Viorica Dancila. She met with the group ahead of two official events, critical uh, events rather, facing her country. A referendum in exactly two weeks over the definition of families and same-sex couples, plus a debate next week in Strasbourg over allegations of corruption. And today, Manfred Weber, an MEP, the leader of the European People's Party, he released a video on Twitter accusing the Romanian government of taking the country backwards. Take a look. The country is going backwards in the fight against anti-corruption and the independence of the judiciary is under pressure. We saw citizens this summer in Bucharest beaten by the police. Frankly, this is not acceptable. The fight against corruption is not a luxury. It is an absolute necessity to protect our citizens and the businesses from state abuse. That's why we urgently ask the Romanian government to change this course. We stand on the side of the European citizens and we will never bargain over the rule of law. Weber's comments come after months of protests in Romania. Tens of thousands of people took to the streets this summer to protest the attempted weakening of anti-corruption laws by the Social Democrat-led government. Around 400 people were injured after clashes with right police, whose response was condemned as brutal by opposition leaders.
Well, joining me in the studio to assess uh, Bucharest's latest moves is our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, your active senior director, Dan Luca, and UK Labour MEP, Claude Mores, also from the Socialist and Democrats uh, group. Uh, da um, Darren, first I want to go to you about what are we talking about here? We're talking about the referendum. Let's just put out yeah, the context. It, it's, it's quite complicated and there are lots of different issues. Uh, as you say, first of all, there is this referendum coming up um, on essentially whether gay marriage should be banned. Now, currently... The law in Romania does not ban gay marriage, but gay marriage is also not legal. Uh, so it was trying essentially in the Constitution something that we've seen many other European countries do the opposite of, uh, for uh, example. Um, but this has come about because three million people signed a petition. It was passed uh, by the Senate and now the, uh, the highest court in the land in Romania has said that this referendum should happen. But that is not what's led to these protests. The protests are also fundamentally about uh, corruption, um, about a scene uh, and a whole series of scandals that have hit Romania in the last couple of years, and this perception that anti-corruption laws and the ability uh, for corruption to be tackled is, uh, is failing. It's and it, and, it, and the, the problem where the protests aren't working, where there's been lots of focus on it and lots of people have turned out, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, isn't because it's such a disparate group. It's, 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 it's everyone who's united against the one thing of the government, but are actually divided on how you can possibly change things. So, so that's what's, ha what's happening uh, in, in Romania. And, Claude, you were in the room uh, yeah. with the, the Prime Minister today. Was it really as heated? Is that true? How heated was it? A question of heated, but she got a very robust uh, and what set did of she questions. Say? Yeah. Uh, she set out what, what the Romanian position was, and I think what it is, um, Darren put it very well, there's a lot of history to this. Are there rule of law issues in Romania? Absolutely. I don't think she shied away from that because it's just patently obvious. I think the line she gave, though, was there are some justifications for this kind of transition. There seem to be pressures on the government, also from the intelligence services and other issues. So she gave a lot of this kind of background. But, but in our group, the Socialists and Democrats, we are very clear. And I'm, I'm chair of the committee that's going to have Timmermans, mm. you know, the, yeah. the commissioner, uh, on Monday examining all of these issues. We're going to have a debate. You know, we, we're the architects of all of this. So, so we, we want her to account... Uh, I, I actually asked about the Vienna Commission that will actually investigate all of this. So we want many of these issues to come out in so the she open. Acknowledged that there she are acknowledged a lot of them. Issues in she the acknowledged country. them, but I think Darren was implying it's quite a complex, murky kind of issue in the sense that many uh, constituencies in Romania are picking on these issues for different sure. reasons. And so I do, and I think if you look at Manfred Weber, and I think this is worth saying on a programme like yours, you know, he seems very keen, uh, very keen uh, to, to suddenly get on to Romania when I think Hungary was not such a great issue for him. Right. So all of this kind of equivalence between Romania and Hungary is a little bit suspect. And Darren, you were also talking to some uh, other people who were also in that meeting. Yeah, uh, today. you have to say are using words like that it was a, a tense meeting, uh, that there was clearly uh, some frustration uh, and anger, actually, I think, some among some of the MEPs um, who were there um, about what is happening. Not least of all, you know, on this gay referendum, uh, there was a sense that this was very contrary yeah. uh, to uh, the principles of, of the SND. And also, you know, bunching in a whole load of stuff also that Romania is yeah. facing. You know, there, were, there was criticism of moving the embassy. Um, there was criticism clearly about sure. the failure to tackle corruption. And, and the sense among these MEPs is that uh, this needs to be tackled, that yeah. this needs to go further. Uh, there's talk about it being talked about in, in committees. And also we know that there is this plenary debate next week in the European Parliament. So I, I think a real sense, you know, talking to people who uh, were in that meeting or around that meeting, that um, you know, this was a very difficult, difficult day. Uh, for uh, the Romanian Prime Minister. Uh, and actually, we tried to, to catch up with her afterwards. Uh, one of our uh, correspondents, uh, Brian Carter, did. And uh, as you can see, she was not terribly willing uh, to talk. Let's have a look, Tessa. Prime Minister, what did you discuss about today with the SD group? Any reaction, Prime Minister? Prime Minister, are you still going ahead with the referendum? Prime Minister, can we get a quick reaction, please? Prime Minister, a reaction regarding the referendum? Prime Minister, what did the SND group say about the referendum on gay marriage? Prime Minister, can we get one reaction, please? 
Dan, I'd like to go to you. You're from Romania. You're, you're following uh, the, this story very closely. The, the, the commentators are saying that all the, the, the referendum talk, it's a distraction from what's really happening in Romania. Can you br bring us up to speed and put the context? Yeah, as my colleague from the plateau said, uh, there are a lot of issues regarding Romania in this moment. Also, we have a Romanian presidency of the EU starting on the 1st of January. Uh, of course, the government is in the left and uh, the referendum with the gay marriage is really not good, neither for the party, neither for the government. There are too many things coming in the same time. Uh, let's don't forget Romania, since the accession is in the morning, monitoring uh, mechanism with the European Commission. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of issues and we need clarification. We need clarification here in Brussels, in Strasbourg, but also in Bucharest. And this is very important and happened that next month, it's a paradox. Romania, it's a paradox in this moment. Uh, the Prime Minister is inviting the plenary to uh, explain the situation in Romania and two, three weeks later, the President Johannes is coming to explain the future of Europe, uh, the Romanian vision. Do you feel that there is resistance from the Romanian government to whatever Europe has to say or the EU has to say they will probably just go ahead and, and, and do as they please. Uh, I suppose there are different issues. It's very good that the Prime Minister was here in Brussels. Uh, let's not forget she was 10 years uh, in this uh, building as a member of the European Parliament, uh, a colleague with my, uh, uh, Mr. Morales. And that's uh, very, very important now about uh, gay marriage will happen. It's clear 6, 7 of October. It's pity that these things happen. I don't believe it was the correct timing. It's not a good question. I, uh, I, it's a shame that happened this uh, referendum. And I was just say, and I think this is, you know, a, uh, again, a sense of this just east-west divide exactly. that we're, we're yes, seeing in, yes, the, yes. in, in the European Union at the moment. Yeah. You know, we add on to Poland, we add on to Hungary, you know, we all know the, the problems with populism, Czech Republic's, you know, there is a real chasm opening up. And it's, it's quite a dangerous moment in some regards because it all depends how the European Union is going to react to yes. this. We have seen uh, Manfred Weber try to take a tougher line. Um, or take advantage. Well, I mean, um, yeah, it slightly. It, it, but I agree, I agree with what you say about the referendum. Let me take that head on. You're absolutely right. I mean, this came by a petition and it's kind of gone into the mix. And yes, uh, people in my group care about it deeply. And I think yeah. you're right to... It's like a running sore. And to be fair, the Prime Minister did answer it. He said it was a petition. Uh, she answered this question also about, uh, about the Israeli embassy, that the president decides, not her. Now, that's irrelevant to the external audience who see these things. And it all adds to this kind of tension. And you're right about the Gulf then that, that starts to open up between Central and Eastern European countries. I was in Poland uh, last week where many of these rule of law issues and sensitive emotional issues arise. What I think is critical is that we don't treat them all as the same thing. Yeah. And I think you'd agree with me on this, that, that we look very carefully at what the rule of law issues actually are. And we have mechanisms for that. We've got Article 7, which many people criticise. But what are the issues in Hungary? What are the issues in Poland? And what are the issues in Romania? But be very fair and balanced about it. No, and, and but what do you think she will need to do when she appears at the end of October? Well, I think, I think she has to answer as Prime I Minister. Think, I'll, on, give on you, that, I'll, give, I'll give you 30 seconds now to say what, is, what, what we, do we look ahead to um, in terms of looking at the situation of the rule of law in Poland? In, uh, in, in you need a lot of clarification seconds. and don't forget uh, the Venice Commission will come with some report in the end of October yes. and it's a very Mid crucial October. report okay. yeah. to base on the arguments because here we have the feeling there are two parts and it's no judge and we need some time. But in the same time, it's not only juridical, it's also ethic. Okay, Political, and we will be, because, because Romania is on the agenda, in Strasbourg uh, next week at a plenary, so we'll be watching that very closely. Now, we'll move on to another topic, because Michel Barnier, this is a name that you probably hear a lot, especially these days in the corridors of Brussels, and we might be hearing a lot more. Let's find out why in today's Power Play. Michel Barnier, you probably know him as the EU's Mr. Brexit. The Frenchman spends his days grappling with the UK government over the terms of the UK-EU divorce. And we could be about to see a lot more of him. Reports suggest France's centre-right party, Les Républicains, has asked Mr. Barnier to be its lead candidate in the upcoming European parliamentary elections. And Barnier is apparently considering the proposal. That means Barnier could be a potential nominee for the EU's top job, president of the all-powerful European Commission. He's certainly qualified, having previously served twice in the Commission and even as a Minister for Foreign and European Affairs in the French government. But he'd have to get the backing of Emmanuel Macron, which isn't guaranteed. And perhaps the biggest obstacle of all is Brexit. Barnier would need to deliver a Brexit that pleases the EU27. And he needs to do it before the deadline for candidate nominations in mid-October. Could the job which propelled him into the spotlight end up being Michel Barnier's glass ceiling? 
let's quickly answer that question, shall we? Darren, what do you think? Gla um, Brexit. I, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, the, the, what people always said is that Brexit needed to go well because Michel Barnier wanted it to go well. Uh, it would be good for his political career. Clearly, I think the stumbling block potentially actually is Emmanuel Macron and whether he's got the backing um, of uh, people in France, but also timing. Mm. Because at the moment, <laughs> there is even the potential that Article 50 may well be extended. So right. timing could be Michel Barnier's biggest Dan, obstacle. And, and let's don't forget, EPP have a Congress in 45 days in Helsinki where they will explain who is the uh, nominee or the elected yeah. person for the EPP to be. Uh, and yeah. it's again, Marfa. I, mean, I, I see the guy regularly because of my committee responsibility. I'm quite impressed by him. Very happy to say that. Um, he's, he's a good operator. Uh, but I get the impression... I was going to say, there's a but coming there. <laughs> I mean, it's not really a but, it's an and. I get the impression, um, maybe it's not an exclusive, but I get the impression that he's in a, a hurry to get this deal done. And I, th I think we're going to see a deal, by the way, uh, with the UK. It's not going to be a fantastic deal. We're going to see a deal, some kind of fudge in Northern Ireland. I think part of this whole organisation is he wants to get this done and he wants to get on with get being on a with candidate. It. Yeah. Go for the I think that's, I think that's, that's what really he wants to do. You heard it here. <laughs> I know, you heard it here first. Um, if that contributes to the, to the general, <laughs> to the general um, rawness of the programme, that's, that, that's what I would say. All right. Well, we do have a lot more for you coming up. After the break, UK opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn. He's headed to Brussels to talk Brexit and we get into what it means after this break. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, if you take it from the UN Secretary General, the world right now has trust issues. Speaking before the United Nations General Assembly, he talked about political polarization, lack of cooperation between nations, and he pointed the finger at a growing crisis. Take a look. Our world is suffering from a bad case of trust deficit disorder. People are feeling troubled and insecure. And trust is at a breaking point. Trust in national institutions, trust among states, trust in the rules-based global order. Yes, we're joined by our panel, Darren McCaffrey, a political editor, James Chris, he's back with us as well, Brussels correspondent for The Telegraph, and joining us is Jennifer Baker, freelance journalist here in Brussels. Jennifer, I'll start with you. Trust deficit disorder, is this the crux of the matter of all the problems that Europe is facing right now? Well, it is certainly one of the big problems, although I would take issue with this idea of a disorder, because a disorder implies something is not normal and not usual. And in fact, actually, distrust in politicians is very usual. When I knew we were talking about this, I looked up the origins of that old joke, how can you tell if a politician is lying, because his lips are moving. <laughs> 1956 is the first time that appeared in print, so this is not new. I think what maybe is new is the ease with which we feel politicians lie. We feel that there aren't enough people holding them to account and that they can't maybe be caught out. Maybe the media isn't doing its job as well as we should. Yeah, no, it, I think politicians have always, what, just been above uh, real estate agents and journalists, <laughs> it must be said, and also because, uh, when it comes to, <laughs> comes to levels of trust. Yeah, the, the implication that, you, as you rightly say, that it's a disorder, that the, the, the responsibility is with the people, you know, having that trust or not, rather than politicians gaining that trust, don't you think? Yeah, I think, I think there has been uh, lots of things, though, that have happened pretty much most notably since the 2008 uh, crisis, that have undermined people's uh, trust. Uh, people would look at the Brexit referendum in the UK. Both sides, both sides uh, clearly made uh, claims that have not uh, come true. Um, and I feel that there is, I mean, well, it's, it's not just a feeling, there are surveys uh, that have been published to show that trust is ebbing away from politicians and institutions. However, this is also part of a wider narrative where people's belief and trust in institutions in general are on the decline, whether they be in things like the church or in banks. And that's to a part because of individualism and scepticism. That's not necessarily and, a bad thing. And quickly, I mean, James, do you think this is what changes the voting way people vote? Well, I don't know. I mean, I looked at Gutierrez there and I thought, well, here's this man standing in an institution which he says no one trusts, saying people don't trust institutions. Well, well OK, so why don't you do something about it? Oh, well, there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. Where, where, right. where, where are politicians most trusted? Which country in Europe? Uh, most, most trusted. Most, most trusted. Somewhere in Scandinavia? Yes. Yeah. Denmark. OK. Least trusted? Britain. 
<laughs> no, actually, Brindle's pretty well. It's kind of Germany in the middle. It's Bulgaria. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Unsurprising in some regards. But you know things like rulings that saying MEPs don't have to disclose their expenses, which we exactly. saw yeah. yesterday, don't help. Exactly. No, they don't. No, All right. Don't. We'll, we're also looking at another very political event this week. We've been keeping an eye on it. The Labour Party conference, and it's wrapping up in Liverpool today. And leader Jeremy Corbyn, he's capped it off with a keynote speech. Here's a bit of what he had to say. But I say to businesses large and small, Labour will also deliver, deliver what you need to succeed and to expand and modernise our economy. More investment in transport and housing and digital infrastructure. More investment in education and skills so workers can be more productive. But most of all, most of all, a commitment to a Brexit that protects the jo jobs, the economy and trade. And determined opposition to one that does not. Does sound like he's already campaigning there, but you know he's he's coming he's coming to Brussels just to just to put that out there. He's coming to Brussels. We know uh, I think tomorrow. James, you wrote about this today. Yeah, uh, Jeremy Corbyn's going to come to Brussels tomorrow, um, and well, wow, this afternoon and this morning, uh, EU ambassadors had an emergency meeting. Uh, to discuss no-deal Brexit planning. And there's two reasons for that. One is during the Labour Party conference, uh, Labour has consistently said they will vote down Theresa May's Chequers deal if it fails to meet the six tests. Now, these are six tests dreamt up by Labour, which she won't meet. So they will vote it down. And secondly, we have Theresa May in New York saying that she is going to turn Britain into a low-tax, competitive... Singapore of Western Europe. Singapore without the sun. No. Uh, <laughs> slash and burn bonfire regulations, which is basically Brussels' worst nightmare, the idea that they'd actually yeah. have to be competitive in a normal... Anglo-Saxon economic <laughs> situation. It, it, is, it, know, it is interesting, though, on, that... the, on the Labour point, I think that uh, there is this speculation, if we are going to go for no deal, if Labour are determined to vote down checkers, if the arithmetic is against May, uh, that actually the Prime Minister didn't absolutely explicitly rule out a, the British Prime Minister a general election on the plane on the way over to New York. She said it would not be in the national interest. A sign, I think, that they would want to blame the calling of election on the Labour Party. And, you know, this meeting today, talk about Jeremy Corbyn becoming Prime Minister, you have to look at the polls. Yeah, they have but, not really moved. But we I don't, probably wait, wait, almost I, certainly I, I don't get the same result. In, OK, Jennifer, the, the, the EU is really afraid of a UK with a Labour government, are they? Is that, is I, that, what, it, is I mean, that what it means? I think, I think the EU is afraid of the UK and all the nonsense that's coming out of it full stop at this <laughs> point. I mean, you, you don't get much sense out of anyone in Westminster Why these days. Why do you days. hate democracy so much? I, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm Why do you self loathing, hate deep, deep personal self loathing. But I just don't <laughs> see how either leader of the two main parties in the UK can deliver anything like a resounding win for everybody concerned in Brexit. But, but you make a really interesting point about the fears that Brussels have about Jeremy Corbyn government. One thing that the Jeremy Jeremy Corbyn manifesto must have in order to work is Brexit and quite a hard Brexit. This is why in the mm. Chequers deal, Theresa May is offering non-regression clauses on various state aid, so government intervention in industry. Jeremy Corbyn wants loads of government intervention wants in industry. Wants to renationalise laws. Wants to renationalise. Where's the money but coming so, from? Well, but you'll have to ask <laughs> him. I think, I, think the pro I think the problem for Brussels is, it, it, and legitimately you can rightly ask, you know, who... Who is it negotiating with and what is it negotiating on? And that is the big problem. James is right. It is democracy. Democracy is messy. But it's also not a good platform to have a negotiation. It's not. But Brussels and, and, has and, never been negotiating. So, it's been well, explaining. No, well, no, it's, yeah, it's, where's the well, negotiation? Well, yeah, but that was, that was the intention of Article 50 in the first place. Mm. You know, this was not meant to be an easy process for whoever okay, look, decided he's, That's why he's we're going to have okay, no He's deal. coming here to, to we'll talk to, uh, to, to Barnier and the rest of, of, of the EU uh, officials. What do you expect from quickly? What do you expect? That's negotiation. That's communication. Well, Michel Barnier would say, no, it isn't a okay. negotiation. He would say, my sole interlocutor is the UK government and my door is always open. Because that's what he says when Whenever anyone turns That's up, all he's he is, allowed to say. He is You've nothing if not repetitive. And, 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 and also, all he would add to that is that even your plan that you've come up with. It's not, it's not deal territory. We're not going to sign that either. So. Right, a lot of Brexit talk see. still still to come uh, over the week. But for, for now, let's move on to today's uh, raw moment. Donald Trump always says that the world is laughing at America. And it turns out he was right. Let's take a look. In less than two years... My administration has accomplished more than almost any administration 
in the history of our country. America's so true. Didn't expect that reaction, but that's okay. Unfazed that they were laughing at America, laughing at. I, 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 mean, I, thought, I thought he dealt with it quite well. Actually. So do I. Yeah. I actually, and I, I thought that was the first time we saw almost that he could actually laugh at himself. Uh, it was almost. A, almost. Almost. Almost as much as any he other put on the fix, He then put on that very fixed kind of smile. Um, yeah, I thought. Yeah, I thought he dealt with but it well. Do you think well. he believed what he was saying there? That you know he has done an excellent job. I mean, yeah, I don't think anyone in that room. That whole speech <laughs> was really kind of monotone, a bit lackluster. You know, he's not used to Donald Trump. We're used to seeing punching the air and hyperbole left, right, and centre. But you know, I mean, you know, one thing he does actually send, and you know, we talked earlier about the youth. You know, one message that the youth should take is: whenever you feel insecure, whenever you feel like you can't do something, just remind yourself that Donald Trump became president, and he's a moron. <laughs> OK, on that note, on that note, we'll so have to leave it James with Christoph. the last word. James gets the last word. Thank you for joining us tonight uh, here on Raw Politics. We'd like to hear your views. Tell us what you're talking about. I'm on Twitter, at Tessa Celia, and also at Ira News. Use the hashtag Raw Politics. Have a good night.